Spatchcock Nation is in the house. Unfiltered, uncensored, and unapologetically for the people. Turn it up. Yo, the after party, we are heading into summertime and things are heating up. We're going to talk about how to throw the best parties with one of the best summertime dudes in the world. And a guy I've also enjoyed some time in the summer with over some beers on boats where we actually thought of this show in the first place. And just a guy that likes to get loose. And he was kind of made for the summer. Even though he's a hockey guy, uh, secretly, he's really a boy of summer. So my partner in crime, the one and only, number 24 in your programs and one in your hearts, Alexander DeRosa. What's up? I will say I'm born for summer because I do like the nice weather. But hockey, like, there's nothing like uh, outdoor pond hockey, snow falling on you, and hockey season in general. But hockey season actually goes until July, so we're still in the middle of it. Well, pond hockey is a thing of the past with global warming and things like that. So you played your last of those games. And you're getting yeah. pretty long in the tooth to be able to lace them up these days. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, I uh, my backyard ice rink is is done. It, it just doesn't doesn't get cold here anymore. So yeah, you know, the well, pond hockey up north though, people in Canada play pond hockey. Like it's it's not it's not over. It's just over for me. Yeah, I mean, way up north, like North Pole North, like like polar, like if the south of the game is a polar bear just comes out and chills. That that far north, you know. Yeah. So backyard stuff. You have a backyard hockey rink. Um, you've also been a champion and commissioner of a backyard wrestling league. Yeah, dude, and you always bring that up. I just can't get away from it. I, it's part it, of who you are. I want the team to follow me. I mean, it, it, you know, you can't hide it. You're a champ. That's what they get. But I bet you also, um, as I was dominated quite a bit of backyard baseball you know the tennis balls and the bats oh yeah dude i used to have all my trees in my mom's backyard were set up perfectly as first second and third and then the fence was in the deep and we used to my the back of their house the siding would be completely ripped off in this one spot everything like built itself and yeah it was the yeah, best time we had like three yards in a row that open up. So like we had, there's a fence and then there were two other like tree lines. So if it went in the air, in those places, they were home runs. But if you'd have a home run directly to center field, the one over this fence, the neighbor there wouldn't give us the balls back. So like, like sand you were, lot, little sand lot style. Yeah, you were booed if you hit a ball over that because then we couldn't get it back. Yeah, no, I, I would just, we would just, I would just jack it over the fence and we'd lose the ball, worry about it later. Multiple tennis balls, we play with tennis balls a lot. We did too, but twice we were playing with tennis balls and one of our friends turned on it and broke one of our neighbor's windows and I was pitching and like the window broke and we all looked and I looked back and all I saw were their asses running away because as soon as it broke, we're out. They weren't even like, oh, so she came out and I'm like, there I am. You know what I mean? But yeah, yeah. I no, those them. were, those were, I don't think I have the backyard for anymore, but I did get a trampoline and so I might start up the backyard wrestling federation with oh totally dude you should be girl. like ddp and your daughters on there and everything teach them yeah, i'm teaching them the moves the suplexes right now yeah well i mean when they get older and they start going to proms i mean they would love to know how to deliver a stunner and start it up you know what i mean yeah which would be a good move so speaking of summer and baseball we have one of the coolest summertime people in the land now this dude has done a lot of cool things and still remains down to earth so um the Auburn Double Days, Double A baseball team, they were doing not the most fantastic in terms of attendance and things like that. And my man came and basically brought it back from the dead. Uh, he did a little small stand doing some construction work and other things, like like working for a construction company. He was like, nah, dude, I'm a baseball guy. So he comes back, takes over the Syracuse Mets, and brings them to a really high level. Like now it's a fun high ticket in there. On top of that, this dude is a great guy to drink beers with. And you also see him, he can talk to a sponsor, a player, a random guy at the bar the same way. This is the great Jason Smorrow. Yay, that guy sounds awesome. <laughs> I've had beers with that guy, so I can I can attest that he he can do some pretty cool shit. That's true. Well, well, well welcome. What do you what, what do you think about the backyard baseball conversation? What was your backyard baseball experience like? We played front yard uh, baseball, so we tennis balls, and we used the uh, we had the, uh, the 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 power lines where the where the home runs. You had to get it up o over that. But we were so close to a school. I'm from North Syracuse, so we would walk over to. Allen Road Elementary, and they had a little baseball field there. And then, as we got a little bit bigger, we were hitting some balls. And I'm not sure who it was, but one of us broke one of the school windows, and we all ran. But they knew it was us, and we got busted. I think we, I think we ended up telling the truth. I think my mother made me call Principal DiCarlo and let him rat myself <laughs> out. You know, I, I always uh, wish that in the setup at the stadium now 
that there was a parking lot behind one of the outfield walls because love to hear like a car get hit, the car alarm go off, and then see like the shortstop from like Paul Tuckett be like, ow, this takeoff once he hears the window break. I am surprised that our players don't break their own windows because they all park and they back in. So the front windshield is facing the stadium. They're like, boys, it looks like a horrible idea because your winch, you, you guys are going to have a huge foul ball and just break your own window. And they're like, oh, no, no, you can't hit it this far. I'm like, I see you guys hit it this far all the time. I have no idea what you're talking about. So I'm rooting for the day that they break their own windows. So some of those fall balls, they go deep. If they clear that roof, they're gone. Yep. They're right in the parking lot. Yeah, they get, they catch a couple of people by surprise out front with some of these smaller stadiums that I used to work at, the Auburn Double Days, the Batavia Muck Dogs. I mean, I, one of my car windows got broke uh, in those. That's where I learned to park backwards so it breaks your back window and not your front window. So now, back in the day. Safe covers that, though, right? Safe light, auto, they yeah. just come and replace it. Like, whatever. Yeah. I hope um, Back in the day, probably, what, 10 years ago now, I used to play music at the Chiefs, uh, game night music and a bunch of those various tasks there. Nine years, I'm going into my 11th year. So probably 12. No, you weren't. Yeah. I don't think you were there. Um, so I was playing, you know, it was like a midweek game. It was like the seventh inning, playing music. Everyone's just, just kind of chilling there. It was a little slow game. And the, the, the player hit a fall ball, and I went right up. And I And you always see those come at you. So I jumped up. Luckily, I was paying attention, jumped up, and it went right through the window and hit me in the stomach. And it was me and Brent Axe, and it was just the only two people there. And he was like, are you okay? And I just kind of fell, like, and knocked the wind out of me hard. And uh, the place, like, everybody looked up, and then I jumped up. I stood up, and they cheered. But oh, yeah. I had a well on my stomach, and the player ended up signing the ball. He didn't know it was – he didn't know who he hit, but he, he signed the ball for me. I was like – Oh, yeah, they're, they're really good about that. And there's – there's still a bunch of holes up in the press box, and they they write the date that it happened, and yep. uh, those windows are pretty sturdy up there because they get whacked. It would have hit me in the face if I didn't move, like directly yeah. in the face. That's awesome. <laughs> I'm glad that you got hit by it too. That makes me happy. That's I've seen a lot. I mean, there's I mean, you never want anybody to get hurt, but there are some funny stories of people getting hit with baseballs. Uh, it, was, it was one of my early years, and and I uh, I could always, always forget this guy's name anyway this before we had the protective nets and the lady was sitting down the first base side and right where it kind of turns is the most dangerous spot she's in the front row it's terrifying there before the nets were there this guy hits her and she had like the outline it was like it's like a baseball was inside of her skin and you could see the stitches and everything and it was like elevated like you know a good inch and a half two inches so you know, I took, I took a picture of it on my phone. I went back in. I talked to this guy. He used to play in the major leagues. I can't remember his name. And uh, and I said, you know, would you sign, you know, a ball or something? He goes, I'll give her my bet. And he wrote on it. He goes, next time I'll kill you. And he signed his name to it and gave it to her. And she thought it was hysterical. Oh man, that is <laughs> awesome. I wish I had a bat like that. That's dope. Was it one of my one of my close friends, uh, Matt, my buddy Pat? His mom during warmups got hit in the mouth, and it was lipstick on the ball. It was the same situation. Got the overthrow from warmups and hit her straight in the mouth. She she had to go to the hospital, but the guy gave her a bat. Didn't sign it something cool like that, but that's a dangerous <laughs> spot. But now it's every it's you know you, we have all the protective netting. It's it's so much better because too many people got hit by baseballs. Now it's a super safe place and an awesome place to be. And you know what? That a lot of that is because of the hard work you've done. So here's a question I got for you, dude. You are always at the park you're there at every home game you're there to the bitter end of every game and when it's when they're on the road you're out talking to people grinding in meetings you're in bars taking sponsors out like how do you stay motivated to put so much of your life into something like that and i know you love it let's hear about like how do you have this engine for that you know it's, it's to me it's what it takes to to do the job you gotta you know i i, I don't own the team but i pretend i own the team i pretend it's my money uh, and you got to pour it all in. It's a 24 seven, you know, job. It's a small business. Like, uh, like so many people are out there and you got to put the love into it and care about it and have passion for it. And, and it's a 24 seven job. You know, there's, there's no such thing as the off season. There's always a chance to, to engage with somebody and, and, uh, to get them to know about what we have going on here. We're the best kept secret in town. We've been here for over 140 years. There's still people that have never been here. People that just, you know, just 
don't have the time or don't think about it or think, oh, I don't like baseball. We specialize in people who don't like baseball. So, you know, I just love what we do. I love the idea of the place. I love the good vibes, uh, you know, that are created by, you know, having a triple A professional baseball team here. And it just needs a little bit of love to make it all work. There's nothing like when the stadium is full, like Memorial Day weekend, those big weekends when everyone's there and the fire. And the best thing that you did, well, one of the best things was the fireworks. Like, there's nothing like fireworks at the park, and they were so far and few between before. You never had fireworks, and like now you know. Like my kids look forward to the fireworks again. Oh, now well, we have fireworks, all right. <laughs> yeah, I remember before I got the job. So I was in baseball, and then I was out of baseball. I was doing that Hilti construction thing, and I was home. My wife are laying in bed. We got the dogs, and the fireworks are going. We're like the dogs are starting to freak out. This is probably like 2010 or something like that, and we're like stupid Chiefs and there's stupid fireworks. <laughs> it might have been like the year before. It might have been like 2012, and we're all like, all right. My wife's like stupid Chiefs. I'm like stupid Chiefs, and we're petting the dogs and the fireworks. And so then the next year I get the job. They used to do like six to ten fireworks shows a year. We do like 30 firework shows now. Yeah. <laughs> People used to call us. My lights go out here in the office every once in a while. <laughs> and, um, and this lady calls me. She's like, yeah, fireworks. Wake up my dogs. I'm like, lady, I know what you're talking about. I used to hate the Syracuse Chiefs because I have dogs. And, and I had to pet my dogs. And they had 10 fireworks shows a year. And guess what? Now we have 30 fireworks shows a year. So I'm... I'm, I understand, and I hated the Chiefs before, but now I hate the Chiefs even more because now we have three times as many fireworks. Well, I, I love the fireworks for all the reasons you said, but also one of your upcoming crazy promotions is going to be uh, burning down houses in the north side because, like, where's in the cash have Like, oh, my God, a warehouse went down, but the Mets won three to two in extra innings. What a banger. We So we set a fire the other night, made the news. Uh, and, and, have, and the best thing about it is, is we can't throw a a night of firework until the Syracuse fire department's on the scene. They're always, the fire truck is here. We can't, we can't do it without them. Uh, and so this, we've, over the years, we've had a couple of small fires. The fire department's always here. The fire department puts the fires out and the, and the fireworks people have, have stuff back there to, to get the small ones before they get into, into what they, they turn into. So this last one was kind of a, kind of more, it looked more visually dramatic uh, and dangerous than it actually was. It was just some dead brush out in, in the, pretty far out behind the stadium. And I usually get done with the fireworks and I yell into the microphone, nobody does affordable family fun like your Syracuse Mets. <laughs> and so this time I yelled, nobody sets the north side on fire like your Syracuse Mets. Everybody got a good laugh out of it. I have a memory from back in the day at the old state. I think it was the old state. Maybe it was just this current one, but not of a fire. Like, I don't know how bad it was. It seemed as a kid like it was a bad fire probably comparable to what you guys just happened but i remember one of them went up and there was a huge flames behind the outfield and it was honestly that much cooler it's a swamp back there so there's not you're not doing much damage back there we used to, a couple of years ago we started more fires there were some fireworks that would go diagonally like this i call them the fire starters <laughs> it would just go over and hit some dry brush and, and start something on fire you know what when as a kid, I went to tons of games, and I love going to games now. But I think about, like, memories of the fireworks. And I don't remember a lot of the promotions as a kid because it was just more fun running around in the stadium. Yeah. But I think about the memories that come from it. And, like, my, my father-in-law, who passed away, grew up on the north side. And he's a devout – was a hugely devout baseball fan, big Dodgers fan, actually. And he once told me that he knew every way into MacArthur Stadium except the front door. And he and buddy would sneak in and go watch baseball all day. So, what do you have any like good stories like that? Like kids that sneak in, or like the people that just that have such a love affair with with the Syracuse baseball community? There's a lot of people that love it. There's those those good old days are gone. Everybody used to. There's so much stories of how young kids would sneak in and Tex would catch them and kick them out, and then they'd sneak back in again. Or I hear stories of like these old guys where their parents used to give them a quarter when they were like eight years old and they'd get on the trolley and go to the old MacArthur stadium and at eight years old, they just let them leave the house by themselves. Um, you know, but it's a little bit different now. There's much less sneaking in, uh, you know, we've got more security guards and more fences and all those things, but, uh, uh, but there's still people that just love to come, you know, so we have some diehards that come 
again, we play 75 home games. This year we started in March and you know, we'll end in, in September. And there's nights here that it's 30 degrees and, you know, nighttime and it's just cold or the wind is blowing and the diehards are here uh, every day. The, the April Shads and the Wayne Zambitos and the Zach Matundos, uh, and you know they're going to be here. I got to be here. I work here. <laughs> These people love it. And, you know, and they're going to show up, and it's, and it's great. Uh, I love those people. I commend those people. I call them the hearty souls. Uh, but that's part of why I love this job is because of the people that you get to meet, the characters you get to meet, whether that's the fan base uh, or, you know, the players or the managers, or the visiting managers, or, you know, we bring in some of these old timers like Lenny Dykstra and Doc Gooden and Daryl Strawberry, and we bring in professional wrestlers. We bring in, you know, people who set themselves on fire and you know other other entertainment acts and it's just the cacophony of of bizarreness that i absolutely love and uh and i think that's that's one of the reasons that i love what i do because every day is a snowflake every day is very similar but every day is unique and individual and it's going to be a different group and sometimes it's funny and sometimes it's touching and sometimes it's moving and sometimes it's poignant and sometimes it's silly and sometimes it's just a regular old day so you never know what you're going to get and and that's what i like about it because it's always something a little bit new every day when you just dropped those names like this is that this is one of the reasons why you're great at this job and great in the community because you just dropped the names of people that i'm assuming are either season ticket holders or people that regularly show up and that that's because you care so I know Alex wants to learn a lot about these, about the promotion and stuff, but how do you get people that are interested in baseball to come to the games? Because you do that pretty well. Uh, you know, by by getting out there, right? By by being uh, advertising and marketing and social media. And a lot of it is, I like to call it the hand-to-hand -hand combat, right? It's just a, being shifties, being nibsies, you know, be it Hafners, wherever it is, wherever I am, and they say, oh, you're with the Syracuse Mets. That strikes up a conversation. I hate baseball. Well, perfect, because we specialize in people who hate baseball. I love baseball. Well, perfect, because we specialize also in people who love baseball. And it just has the conversation, and you humanize it, and you talk to people. And talk to whether I'm at the grocery store or the liquor store or the gas station. I was just at Battery World today. And I was going in to return some batteries, changing, exchanging some batteries. And this little, nice little couple was coming in. And she says, you're small. I said, yes, I am. She says, we used to go to games at the old MacArthur Stadium. We haven't been for years. And they look like to be in their late 70s or early 80s. And we had a conversation. I said, you know, we're still open. You can still come to a baseball game. So you're wonderful. I was like, well, we'll see if I'm wonderful. If you actually show up, we have day games. You can come to day games. She goes, I'm not going to a night game. So hopefully that lady will show up with her husband. And hopefully I'll remember him. And I'll be like, battery world lady. <laughs> Love That's it. That's awesome. Um, I, I think that there, there's probably so many of those people that, you know, I try to go to the, the girls love it. They love that little area with the grass where it's just like pure mayhem. Yeah. I, always, I always laugh at the one usher who is sitting there and he's his job or their job. Short is to, yeah. Just like literally maintain the, the craziness of the kids. Like the kids are going to fight to the death down there and the kids guys are just trying to keep order. Um, what, what, what is the craziest promo idea you've come up with that you, that, that you never did that got vetoed? That was like too we far. You never did. That, that someone was like, this is going to be too far. Or even just one. Like, I have a lot of uh, crazy promotional ideas in the past. Well, you know, I know that, like, like well, back in the day, we did a lot of, you know, when we first took over here, it was uh, 2014 was the first season. We didn't have any money. We didn't have anything. We were just doing low. We, we were the kings and queens of the low-cost promotion. So we would just have – ugly sweater night and mullet night and you know pirates and princess day and just you know raid your closet and come up with silly costumes and, and do some things uh and brandon massey always wanted to drop ten thousand skittles on the field from uh from a helicopter which we we poo-pooed that idea it was picking up the 
all the skittles of that thing. I've always wanted to have cat night. We always have dog night. Dogs get three nights. And I know that having cats here would be an absolutely horrible idea, even if they were just trapped in their little containers and just making that sound they make when they're in the car. Wow. Yeah, and it yeah. would just be annoying. But uh, most of them we've, we've, we've done. You know, we, we don't do anything, you know, too pushing the envelope too far. Uh, you know, we like to have a little bit of fun and not take ourselves too seriously. You know, when we started, we were just the Chiefs and we were community owned. And now that we're owned by the Mets, we probably have toned it back a little bit, you know, because we have a a, a larger uh, corporate presence uh, with the Mets organization. But they get the minor leagues, uh, and 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 they allow us to have a little bit of fun as well. I love the cat idea, even though I'm not a cat fan. I could picture that whole little kid area just filled with cats. Right, and there's a couple of them to be on leashes, and there's always that guy in the neighborhood. There's one guy that walks his cat. Oh yeah. <laughs> Totally. I, I love the dogs. I mean, the dog at a ballpark, I, I don't think I'd ever bring my dog, but people that bring their dogs, it's great. When they do it inside of hockey games, I don't, I'm like, I don't get bringing your dog inside to a hockey game. Like, there's no draw. Yeah, we, can, we have, we have spots. We have such a big stadium. We have spots. We just, we've already had one bark in the park. We have two more scheduled. We're going to reschedule this one. Back in the day, another player whose name escapes me, he was funny. He said, I'm going to give $100 to whoever's dog takes a dump on the field first. Because we have the, used to be the Chiefs Minster Pet Parade. Now it's the Mets Minster Pet Parade. And we would tell these people, like, you could enter the Mets Minster Dog Show. And if you win, you get an automatic entry into the Westminster Dog Show. At least half of the people would believe us. Uh, and then they're like, I, I, we're, me and Muffy are going to Westminster? We're like, no, you're not. This is, we're just us being stupid. So that year that that guy bet $100. For the first dog to take a dump, my dog took the dump. Teddy Toots uh, took said dump on said field, uh, oh. and they gave me a hundred dollars. Said you don't have to give me a hundred dollars. I'm giving you a hundred dollars. So I gave it to my my daughter, little Mary Sparkles, uh, at the time, and she went up and and gave it to Bubba's Beds because the Bark in the Park has all the local dog rescue people. I I have a dog from the Bark in the Park. That's awesome. That's and super great, funny, and I love a hundred dollars. Like the, the the player, it was nice of him to do that. He could have he could have probably gave you like ten thousand dollars to the winning winning dog. Yeah, I would have taken that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you would have cracked your daughter, your daughter off a hundred out of that. I'm like, all right. I was like, honey, you gotta go donate this to somebody. She's like, I can't keep it. I'm like, you can't keep it just because our dog took a dump. That's what he does. Yeah, yeah, he was made to do that. <laughs> so when you're thinking about like um keeping people engaged, right? And and you, you've done a great job at that. Something else I, I, I want to hear some of your thoughts on is like, there are people in any community, especially when you're a community leader like you are, you're always going to have some haters and people that talk shit, right? Like, um, oh, the, the games are more expensive, the damn fireworks, you know what I mean? Like the Mets, whatever it may be. How do you deal with that? Like, how do you take that in stride? Because, mo I mean, I, I don't hear people say anything about you being a jerk, but rather like, oh, they changed this to that, but you, you deal with it well. How do you do it? I think you listen to it a little bit, you know, because what if they're right? You know, what you know, what if the fireworks are detrimental to people's, you know, sanity? You know, like but if enough people are saying, ah, those people are just haters. But I think you have to listen to it a little bit just to make sure you're not doing something stupid. Um, but the other part is we think that we're coming from a good spot. We're doing this to be a win 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 situation. It's it's good for the team because something like fireworks or a promotion, you know, people come to the games uh, by, by, you know, us being here is, is good for the community. So there's something to do, whether it's hockey, baseball, the university, the Everson, the landmark, the concerts, the amphitheater, it's, we're just part of the whole community. Um, and, and everyone's going to hate, you know, there's, there's literally, you can't, I mean, if we're low on engagement, on social media, we'll put up ketchup or mustard on a hot dog, and half the people will yell at the people that like ketchup, and the other half will yell at the people that like mustard. And it's literally about ketchup or mustard, nothing that you should actually hate on. So most of the stuff uh, is is low importance. We try to take ourselves out of out of anything that's super controversial. We try to give a voice to everybody over here at the stadium, you know, and we'll have nights for for just about everything you know whether it's you know in the community we seem to like dogs more than everybody else they get three nights uh as opposed to everybody else but 
you let it roll, uh, and you know, and and in a couple of weeks, uh, everyone's forgotten what they were yelling about anyway. And a lot of times, I just head straight into it, head on. All right, bro, what do you got? What are you hating on us for? One guy currently is hating on us because we play seven inning double headers instead of nine inning double headers. He's been coming here and hating on things since 2014. That's when I engaged with him. I'm sure he's been coming here since 1977 and hating on things and just yelling at people be- other than me beforehand. His name is Steve. And so he emails me and then I email him back and I see him in the stands and he thinks it's our decision that we play seven inning games and not nine inning games. We have nothing to do with it. Major League Baseball tells us what we're supposed to do. He can't understand that concept. So he and I engage quite a bit. But you keep engaging him, and that's awesome. So, all right, we're going to engage you in, in some – we want the full frontal action in terms of um, – Nobody, Nobody's ever said that to me ever before in my life. <laughs> it was the first time my life came, man. Frontal, Jason. So we we want you to settle um, an urban legend story for us. All right. We have different um we have we have differing views on it. Um, the story goes like this: It is um, the early '90s, and he hasn't been called up yet. But Ed Sprague Jr. is playing third Eddie base. Sprague. Yeah, um, he's a good player. I have third base. Syracuse Chiefs, I believe. Yep, yep. Number nine. Well, I forget. No, I forget what number he was. What did you, did you say the number? You remember the number? I don't remember. Nineteen, maybe. I don't know. So, anyways, um, the story goes that he uh, strikes out looking and unhappy with the call and makes it very clear he's unhappy with the call and immediately gets the hook. He's ejected, and you know, which is one of my favorite things is watching baseball players be ejected, kicking dirt and stuff. So he's out. And an inning or so later, um, in enters Scooch, the Chiefs mascot. And he's got like big muscular calves, and this scoot. <laughs> is going hard at the umpire, really hard at the umpire. And the, the urban legend is Ed Spray got tossed, went back in, gave the mascot guy like 50 bucks. He's like, hey, man, give me that uniform. <laughs> what do you know about that story? This is the first time I'm hearing of it. I'm oh, going to start doing some investigative reporting because there's still people alive today that can come up with the answer to that story. Has anything like that happened since? Oh, they like, get, you know, it, you know, it coming back in disguise and, and this, that, and the other thing. No, uh, I don't think so. You know, the guys are, they get kicked out. They get kicked out. They, they, no one's, no one ever really wants to get into scooch. <laughs> yeah. But I love that story. I love, uh, we'll have to, we can get to, we can get to somebody. I can call Randy Knorr and ask him that or uh, some of our old, uh, oh, Dick Scott, our current manager. He probably knows. I'll ask him. He was an old Blue Jay for a long time. Find out. We, we need to get to the bottom of that. And All right, we'll write that down. Send that one to me. Eddie Sprague uh, taking Scooch. Scooch when he was super creepy back in the day. Early Scooch was definitely creepy. Yeah, yeah, stuff of nightmares. <laughs> so, I am. I, um, I mean, I, I know a lot of people. I, I've heard a story. Uh, well, I, I know that uh, that back when it was turf, the uh, uh, Chad Matola. The Chiefs were just doing horrible, and and Chet that he needed a rain out, but it's hard to get a rain out on a turf field. So he went out the night before and uh, and and got the hose and and put it on the pitcher's mound and just left the hose on all night to destroy the pitcher's <laughs> mound. So they had a a, a a a rain out, and the the clubby. I was talking to the clubby at the time, Jody Pacello, famous clubby. I was like, how did he how did he get the hose? And Jody's like. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I, I couldn't even imagine how how he would get access to any of that stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I I love stories like that, and I, I think about like um, we want to hear some of the cool like player interaction crazy stories because I, I remember uh, one of our friends, um, our buddy Ricky, was at a game when Carlos Delgado was on his rise up through the through the system. And uh, there was a foul ball coming on the first base side, and he's getting in towards where the stands is. And as the ball lands into his glove, our friend Rick pulls it out of his glove, and he's like, "Hey, man, we're on the same team here. Like, you know, like I'd give you another ball." Um, or one time we we heckled this dude that's playing second base for Norfolk because he wouldn't give this little kid in our section the ball. So we were unrelenting and heckling him. And actually, after the next inning, after they had thrown the ball in the infield, he came over and gave the kid the ball, and he goes, "Now you guys better shut up." <laughs> what are some of your interactions with that type of player fan craziness? 
Well, a million years ago, when I was just at an old Chiefs game from uh, probably in the in the late '80s. Uh, me and my buddies, and we were heckling the opposing pitcher. I don't remember what team he was from. Uh, and he was, you know, kind of giving it back to us because we were right up next to the visitor's dugout. And uh, and uh, and we're heckling the guy. And Rob Ducey uh, comes. It was playing for the Chiefs. And we're like, Ducey, you got to hit this pitcher. Hit the ball. Bat it and hit it into him. He's like, uh, okay, dudes. <laughs> He's like, why? It's a very specific thing you want me to do. And we're like, yeah, hit him or something. And so he he gets a hit and it actually hits the pitcher. He makes it to first base. He ends up coming around to score. And me and my buddies, Jim Brady, Dan Dungetti, we're giving him high fives at the net. We're like, oh, my God, you did it. He's like, oh, my God, I did it. <laughs> <laughs> and then a million years later, I'm running the team and he's the – hitting coach or the special coordinator for the Lehigh Valley Iron Pigs. So Rob Ducey, you don't remember me, but in 1987, uh, I was a high school kid and I was asking you to hit somebody. He's like, I don't remember, but that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome though. That is super awesome. I think you know, of good guys that come through like Nick Swisher, you know, he was oh, coming to the visiting team and there was this little old lady and she had a sign. She was like, I want to meet Nick Swisher or something like that. And so I took a picture of it, and and I was in the in the visiting clubhouse. I go, lady, they go, this lady wants to meet you. He goes, I saw her last night. She like put something on my Instagram or or some whatever social media it was at the time. He goes, I'm gonna come in and meet her. I said, great. So he came out of the locker room, came in the front. I got the lady. She's in the she's in the in the office, and he just sat down with that lady for 15, 20 minutes, just talked with her, uh, hung out with her, took pictures with her. He took off. Uh, and he couldn't have been a, a nicer guy. So every time he came to town, you know, people would want to meet Nick Swisher. So I'm like, Nick Swisher, I go, you can say no to this, but there's some people that are huge fans. They want to meet you because I'll meet them. It's like, bring him over to the end of the tunnel or whatever. So we'd meet these people. Another people, another time wanted to meet him. He's like, and, and his wife went into labor. So he was trying to get out. So he's rushing to get out of the game. He's cleaning up. I said, Nick, I go, I'll just tell those people you were supposed to meet that your wife's in the labor. You got to go. He's like, he's like, no, no, no. I told him I meet him. I'm going to meet him. So you get him in the spot. They're getting three minutes, but I'm going to meet him. So I got the people in the right in the in the tunnel, our horrible tunnel, right behind the visiting dugout, uh, underneath in between the the clubhouse and the field. And he came out. He took some pictures with them, and he zipped in. He's like, I'm sorry, I can't spend more time with you, but I got to go. My wife's giving birth. I mean, what? Nope. Nine, 99 out of 100 other baseball players are not doing that. Uh, and, and Nick was cool enough to do that. Nick Nick Swisher sounds like, honestly, be, even before you told that story, he, he just seems like he loves the game so much. Loves being, you know, even when he was on the Yankees, like he just loves everything about it. He had so much fun being it. And that's, so that's awesome to hear. Because the worst is hearing that that him specifically is not a cool dude. Like if you were like, oh, he would never meet people or, if all it took was to bring a sign, I would have brought a sign. I want to meet Nick Swisher. And most of the guys are pretty cool. I mean, Tebow was very cool. He used to meet people, you know, he, 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 if you wanted to meet a special needs kid or something like that or yeah. somebody of faith, he's like, Jason, I guess, you know what the spot is? You know the time is? You just tell me to be there and I'll I'll meet with him. There was some guy that was in a bar and wanted to talk Florida Gators football. He's not doesn't want to meet with that guy. He wanted to meet with – you know, the, the people that he could uplift and, and help a little bit. G-Man Choi, somebody really wants to meet him. He's a special needs guy. I'm like, G-Man, I, go, I got a guy that needs to meet you because he got pushed out of the way by some other guys during an autograph thing. He's like, I go, I got a great spot that Tebow set me up with. He's like, yeah, I'll meet the guy. So nine times out of ten, the guys are pretty cool. That's that's awesome. So when you were before the Auburn double days, what 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 was the big hook? Were you always looking to do this in baseball? Was this always the thing or were you just looking to get into sports? Uh, I didn't know. I went to college. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I originally wanted to be a game show host. And, uh, no and I guess in some way, shape, or form, I've kind of turned into a game show host. I, I have a little microphone, and I have a lot of people, and uh, sometimes I actually ask trivia questions out, out there. But um, I didn't know what I wanted to do, and I did an internship with the Watertown Indians back in the day in Watertown, New York. And a dynamite lady came to town. And she would take herself out in, in a box at the end of the game. She'd put herself in the box and she'd put four sticks of dynamite uh, on the box and she'd blow herself up. And the whole stadium would shake and the whole place would be full of smoke. 
And when the smoke cleared, Dynamite Lady would be standing there in her little gold, her little glittery American Stars and Stripes outfit, and everybody cheered. So my boss at the time, his name was Jack Trotz, and he would always put me at the front gate and say, you sit there every night and you thank everybody for coming and see how they had a good time. So I was doing it that night. And, uh, and everybody was coming out having a blast. They were like, oh, my gosh, that was so much fun. We had a great time. Everybody had a smile on their face. They had their kids on their shoulders. I was like, you know what? This is what I want to do because we just made people happy for three to four hours, got a chance to escape life a little bit. It's cheap. It's affordable. And everybody can have a good time when you can watch a baseball game and then some lady blows herself up in a box. It's fantastic. Yeah. That, I love that, the blowing herself up. That's like a is she, I wonder if she still exists somewhere in the world. That's what I learned about explosions versus implosions. Uh, and uh, technically, I was the director of special projects at the time, and it made a big mess on the field. And I was after I shook everybody's hands and I went back in. I said, "Who's got to clean that up?" They're like, "Well, technically, that's a special project, and you are the director of special projects, so you have to go clean it up." It's mostly styrofoam. That is that's awesome. awesome. <laughs> with, with with the with the double days, the the vibe is a little different there, right? It's it's obviously smaller and. Those games are awesome in itself, too, because everyone just kind of walks to the stadium. It's like old school baseball. Were you allowed to push the limit there? Like, what was your first per- – when you when you took over there, what was the first thing you did, the big splash you made? Well, the first thing I, I wanted to do was get rid of Dollar Thursday. And Tom Ganey was the president of the team. He's the president of Savannah Bank. And he had a cigar in his mouth. He's like, kid, if they broke, don't fix it. I said, all right. I said, all right, I'll do Dollar Thursday. So I'm doing my thing, and we're marketing, and we're doing all this stuff. And he comes up to me. He's, he's like, kid, he goes, uh, I've been watching what you're doing, and you got a lot of excitement around here. You're not going to be ready for your first dollar Thursday. I was like, we're going to be ready. He goes, you're not going to be ready. He's like, take this piece of paper and put it in your pocket. I said, all right. Put paper in my pocket. First dollar Thursday comes. Stadium holds like 2,500 people. We got like 3,500 people. It is mobbed uh, and crazy little Auburn, New York. It's just packed. And we're in the first inning and we're out of hot dogs. And I'm sweating. And Tom's got a cigar. And he walks up to me. I go, dude, I go, we're out of hot dogs because I told you you weren't going to be ready. He goes, you still got that piece of paper? I was like, yeah, I got the piece of paper. He goes, call the number on that piece of paper. So I get the piece of paper. I call the number. And it's uh, Sam Indelicato from Indelicato's Meat Market in Auburn, New York. He answers the phone. He goes, you're out of hot dogs. I go, I am out of hot dogs. He goes, I'll be there in five minutes with a thousand hot dogs. <laughs> wow. That's awesome. <laughs> so what was the reason for getting rid of it? Why did you want to get rid of it? What was I thought it was dumb. I said, how are you supposed to make any money selling yeah. hot dogs for a dollar and, and tickets for a dollar and everything? But I was quickly converted to the magic of dollar thursday uh and you know when i was getting, doing my interview for this job so i did the double days and that was my and i got out of baseball in 2003 and i got a real job and then uh the chiefs came and knocking uh in late 2013 they were having some troubles and a guy named bill dutch was the president of the team at the time and he remembered me from years ago uh, and I got a, I see a Facebook, it's a Sunday night and I'm doing my, getting my prepped up for my work for the rest of the week and my little CRM system. And I see a Facebook friend request from Bill Dutch. I was like, ah, oh, all right, the Dutch man, I haven't seen him in 10 years, whatever. And then my wife comes up, she goes, there's a guy on the phone for you. His name is Bill Dutch. I said, hey, I said, hey, Dutch man, what's going on? And he's like, how'd you like to be the general manager of the Syracuse Chiefs? I said, hold on a second. I said, honey. Can I be the general manager of the Syracuse Chiefs? And she's like, what's that mean? I go, it means you'll never see me again and we can't go to camp. She goes, you can't go to camp. I'm fine with it. Go be the general manager of the Syracuse Chiefs. I said, that sounds like a good idea, Bill. So he's like, all right, you got to interview. You know, there's an interview the next day. I said, all right. So I went to the interview and, uh, and they asked me what I thought about the Syracuse Chiefs. I said, the Syracuse Chiefs stink. They're the most boring baseball team I've ever seen in my life. And I choose to bring my family to go to 
Auburn because it's it's fun, it's more quaint, and you need to figure out how to get that vibe from Auburn over here to the Chiefs. Like you guys aren't in the baseball business, we're in the entertainment business. I said, what would you do if you had got this job? I said, I'd do the same crap I did in Auburn. Dollar Thursday, fireworks, promote giveaways, kids eat free on Sundays, run the bases. I go, just engage the community and it'll all work out. And stop thinking you're a baseball team. We don't get to decide who plays first base. We don't get to pick our own players. So, you know, we can't control the weather and we can't control what goes on the field. All we can control is the rest of it, is the promotions, is the fun, the cleanliness of the stadium, the customer service, just wanting people to be here and, and, and engaging with the community. And we've been doing that, and it's kind of been a, a, good, a good run here for the last 10 years going into our 11th year. And now we're toe-to-toe -to -toe with the uh, basketball team as being the top attended sporting event in town. That's awesome. And if we get a little that. sunshine, we're locked in. You can't beat us. All we need is sunshine. Sunshine, yeah. yeah. I love how you went right at it. It was like, no, it's boring. I mean, what did they? What, how did they react to that? They were a little taken off, uh, off by it as I get my lights back going. I don't think that they expected that answer. Yeah. Um, but you know, I had I had a great job that I liked, so I wasn't. I was just being brutally honest, and it was the best interview that I ever had in my life. And then I asked him, I said, how has it been working for you asking for players all these years from insert team, the Toronto Blue Jays, the Washington Nationals? Like, because uh, they asked me, I said, would you, would you call and try to get good players? I said, no, I will not make that phone call. Because that hasn't worked for you guys for the last 20 years. It's not going to work going forward. They're in it to develop their players. We're in it to provide a nice, clean place for people to come and have fun and watch baseball games. Yeah. And yeah. If you win, it's lightning in a bottle. Yep. The, you're you're not the you're not the the GM of the the Mets is not gonna keep his job because the Syracuse Mets are doing well. He's got the New York. They rarely the call me to ask me my opinion on baseball matters. <laughs> <laughs> As well, they shouldn't. <laughs> Alex, before we get to the video, I want to ask Jason about a question that. Um, that I, I know he'll have a good opinion on, and maybe he's even done this, but there's also something that I have not completed. And um, I don't think in this stage in my career, I could complete it. But actually, I think actually I just lied. I think I could. But have you or anybody that you know in the baseball world um, completed the 999? I could do nine beers, easy peasy. Nine hot dogs and nine beers in nine innings, 0% chance. Especially if you're going to go with the delicious, nutritious, natural casing six to one Hoffman hot dog we serve here at historic MB2 Bank Stadium. Now maybe some of these run of the mill ballparks are gonna give you a smaller hot dog. Maybe you got a better of a chance. But six hot dogs is a pound of hot dogs. And then there's three more and then all the buns. Come yeah. on. I'll do 18 beers in nine innings, but I can't eat nine hot dogs. <laughs> yeah I, I think the same thing, but you know what the last like uh like um it was probably September. I was there. I had a couple of beers, and I like I, I had like a couple of the big beers, big crafties. Yeah. I put those down. I had a hot dog, and my dad was like, "Yo, let's get another hot dog." I'm like, "Yeah, let's do it." And we're walking back. I'm like, "I could do the 999." And he's like, "Really, man? Because it's like the bottom of the fourth inning right now. You've had two beers, and you're getting your <laughs> hot dog, and you think you could pull it off." But I, I was like, "Man, that would be a promotion, dude!" Like, well, we're now gonna do, like we're gonna do the 999. Now we do. 16 ounce beers uh you know they're three dollars uh we do the 16 ounce night everyone can't get over the fact that we do 16 ounce 1911 hard ciders for three dollars it's awesome and we still do the regular old six to one natural casing often hot dog and cooney and they're like we need to use a cheaper hot dog i'm like that's not the deal the deal is you got to do the same hot dog yeah. you know and then so that's kind of our niche right we do things that nobody else does nobody else sells hot dogs for $2. Nobody sells $3 beers at a, at a sporting event, a professional sporting event. Nobody lets kids eat for free. Nobody does, you know, Taco Tuesday. Nobody does, you know, every day of the week, something is literally going on here that we're able to make it affordable uh, versus, you know, so many things in the world that are just going up, up, and up. I mean, right now, you know, our chicken wings are less expensive than other restaurants are selling chicken wings for. We should just raise our prices and say we're a baseball stadium, so it's supposed to be more expensive. 
<laughs> yeah, like everyone just accepts it now, but you're right. Like you can't get – and especially you have a week full of games or two weeks straight of games, and you have to draw interest on those Tuesday, Wednesday nights when it's like, you know. And it's a different – because it's a different swerve, right? So, I mean, if we only played on the weekends or, you know, a Friday and a Saturday or Friday and Sunday, whatever, but you got to play six days a week, 75 days a year. You know, we have a weird business. We play Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, off day Monday. They go on the road. We've got a couple of back to back. We got a back to backer coming up here in June, so we're going to play twelve games in thirteen days. Um, and only uh, April Shad, Wayne Zambito, uh, uh, Zach Matundo, uh, the Spalding family, Marty Nave, Dave Smolnicki, Don Smolnicki. Uh, we'll make all 12 of those games for certain, and there'll be a few others that 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 make it as well that I, that I might be forgetting their names. That's awesome, Matt. I think you could do it uh, easily. You could you could take three beers down in the inning like no problem. I, I think we should give it a shot. Yeah, but is he doing it. three velvet fox or is he doing three? Unicorn? No, he's got to do like light beer. I think if I think for it to work, you got to do light beer. I mean, the, the beers isn't the question. I could the beers isn't. Yeah. Not- non-factor but it should be a lighter beer like a like a, a utica club i think would be my yeah. choice you can get a blue light you can get a coors light yeah oh yeah coors lights those will go quick um yeah. but the dogs will add up especially but with my luck too we'll be doing it maybe the three of us doing it and then all of a sudden like we look up and it's like a dual no hitter and the game is like just flying by <laughs> due to like we'll have three pitch innings and everything and be like oh my That's god where we get tough when you're like midway through and the, the inning just yeah Double headers are the worst thing for Dollar Thursday. It gets a little a college night is also not a good mixture for Dollar Thursday. We have to replace a few bathroom signs from last uh, Dollar Thursday, which was college night. Double edged sword. Sold a lot of tickets, but there's a little damage and we had to kick out a lot of drunk college kids. <laughs> like, like the nickel beer night in Cleveland, like that started a riot, you know? With mini bats. Make it nickel beer and <laughs> mini bat night. That's a <laughs> bad promotion that I wouldn't do. <laughs> My 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 favorite thing now because I hate I hate going anywhere where I have to sit in my seat like concerts I just like to like hang out and talk and yeah. you know go into the Mets Stadium uh, Yankees are a little bit more strict on this but the Mets Stadium you can go anywhere and just hang out there's like tables and so that left field bar and everywhere now that you can just kind of hang out it's like my favorite thing you know yeah you have to walk there. around so and we have. There's a secret little spot, too. You may not know about the Hall of Fame that we have underneath the Metropolitan Club. So if you're at the beer garden and you kind of walk down that ramp, you'll walk, you'll be right in our, our Hall of Fame. And it has old pictures of old Mac and pictures of the old Yankees. There's probably a picture of Eddie Sprague in there. We'll have to look for one of him. In the mascot. Scooch. Come on if there's ever a picture of Scooch giving the finger to an umpire, like, that's probably no. Eddie Sprague. Uh, you know, so there's that. There's the 315 bullpen bar where every dollar Thursday we have a DJ out there. So Joe Driscoll is the house DJ. Uh, and then when he can't make it, we had DJ Gita for uh, Latino night. Uh, and we have DJ Bella, and she brings up a bunch of young uh, DJs on three or four nights. DJ Pop Pop is, is a youngster that's getting into the DJ game. So Thursday wow. nights are the place to be. It's the party before the party. Or if you're like old like me, it's just the party and then you go to bed. But then all the young people then go to Coleman's, they go to Tip Hill, and everybody has oh, a yeah. Yeah. I will say the uh, – I got to tell two stories here. One, I'm so glad you got rid of the family fun zone in right field because I used to watch home run balls go right into the bounce houses with the kids jumping. It just was a bad mix of, <laughs> of a spot. But one bad, bad, I'm going to tell a story because Matt would tell it differently, and Matt's story is a little exaggerated. But we were at a game, and I was the only person in the stadium wearing this Got Melky shirt. Melky Cabrera. That's, was there. I'll tell the real version. No, no, no. So um, I, we went to the game, and I love Melky Cabrera, huge Yankees fan. We're there. I was wearing the shirt. Went after. I lived on Tip Hill. Uh, met up with. It was the first time I met Matt that day. So we, I got rumor that Melky and I forgot who he was with. A couple other players were at home. It was like a block down the street. So I was like, oh, shit. So we left the house quickly to go meet him, and I was still wearing the shirt. So Matt shows up, and the entire time at Coleman's, I was playing it cool. Like, I'm going to go get his autograph, but I'm not going to go like – Matt was heckling me the entire time. He was like, Melky Cabrera, this guy loves you, like yelling from the corner. And he just made a scene out of it. And I went up there, and I said, hey, man, I'm, I'm a huge fan. I'm wearing your shirt. And the girl he was with, well, he was pretending he couldn't speak English, which I don't know if he could or not. 
the girl he was with was like kind of like brushing me off and i finally was like i'm the only one in this bar wearing your shirt and then he signed he just like scribbled all of my shirt and sent me on my way get out of here get out of here kid I won't tell a different version of that because that that does seem pretty accurate. But it was weird because how he got his his uh, how his wife, his now wife April, who's awesome, how she got him to actually go on a date with him was she bought a Malky Cabrera jersey. So she so he went, oh my god, I like Malky too. But we were actually uh, Dominic Cervelli was Francisco Cervelli. See, like he was like a backup catcher for like the Pirates and the Yankees and this guy, right? Yeah. Uh, so I I don't even remember his first name. Well, Alex did. And he, he was the cow. He, he was like an, a, a solid Yankees catcher for a while. Okay. He was a solid backup Yankees catcher. So he was, which he was. He was. He was. So, anyways, he was in town like a rehab assignment or something. So, Alex, me, his wife, my wife, uh, his brother in law, like Alex made us go on like a 15 bar bar tour because there are rumors like, oh, Cervelli's there. So, we can't find Cervelli. And we're just like, oh, let's give up. So, we lose Alex's brother in law who all of a sudden, like 20 minutes later, texts us all at the same time. We all look and a picture of him with Sir Valley. So <laughs> I'll let you look at Alex's story about Melky because he was more like, Melky, Melky. It was wild. Yeah. Well, you know what? Francisco Cervelli, and I never got to meet him. And we went down to uh Chicago Cubs game and he was on the Pirates at the time. And remember, I took the selfie with him. You were gone. You, you had to leave the stadium. But I took this, a selfie and I was right next to Sir Valley. Did he have to leave the stadium, or is he told to leave the stadium? Uh, he was he was nicely escorting. A friend out of the stadium. Actually, no, Jason. I so the way you said it, I was like, mm, "There's something, there's something behind yeah. that." Yeah, that was the best. That was actually the best baseball stadium experience in terms of the staff I've ever been to. One of our friends had been overserved. My overserved before the game, he'd overserved himself. <laughs> he was, he was overserved third. in the parking lot, which yes. is remarkably. So the third inning, the Cubs were like, this guy's got to go. And I'm like, what? He can't go anywhere by himself. They're like, well, you're taking him. But the guy, the guy, like, we're going to grab you. We'll, we'll call you a cab. And he gave me a ticket for reentry and a beer ticket and was like, take care of your friend. And if you can get back here in time, you can come back in the game. And I was super impressed with that. That's but my move. There's a bar there, right, that has like a, like a replica of the center field wall, like the Wrigley Field wall. So I'm like helping our friend back into that, our Airbnb. And I'm like, ugh. And all of a sudden, Alex texts me oh, the picture of him in front of the, the the wall. And I'm like, lose my mind. I'm like, these jerks are on the field. And I'm here in this cab. Oh, it was wild, man. Yeah, I've never been to Chicago uh, at all. But uh, I, I need to get to Chicago. I love Pittsburgh's baseball stadium, Major League. I love City Field. City Field's great. Yeah. What number? How many have you been to in the, what would you say, roughly? Major League, uh, not really, not that many. I've been to Nats Park. I've been to Old Yankee Stadium, New Yankee Stadium, City Field, uh, Pittsburgh, uh, Fenway Park. Um, that might be it. Yeah, no, Wrigley Field was awesome. And the whole vibe around the street, like earlier, there's like batting cages and bars, which is a terrible idea. Um, yeah. It sounds fun, and I and I and I did it. I finally got a I finally got a swing, and it was I wasn't even I wasn't even overserved at that point, but it was so slippery from beer that I my first swing at this fastball, I wiped out and fell right on the ground. Um, yeah, right, it, yeah, and bars the ground was, was so slippery; it was crazy. <laughs> um, okay, so we're gonna show you this video clip. I feel like we covered this a little bit, but we're gonna show you this, and I got a question for you. All right, get it up, Susan. Oh yeah. So this is one of the greatest clips uh, out there. Obviously, you've seen this before. I just saw it this week on uh, the Pat McAfee show. Love that show. They were interviewing him, and they showed this like 30 times, and he was telling a story about it. What is the craziest thing you've seen all all around, not even fan-related, baseball-related, whatever, at the, at the stadium since you've been working there? Hmm. Well, I did see an unfortunate one. It was pretty crazy. I was actually here as a guest of, of the Simones. I was out of baseball, and I just came over, and they brought they had me come in, and I was upstairs with my, my daughter, and she was a baby girl. Uh, and, and we were just up in the press box, and somebody was walking on the lower concourse, and, the, and a bat went out of a guy's hand and hit this person in the back of the head, and they fell down. Their head hit the concrete. And all you could see, and I was up in the press box, and you just see this pool of blood that must have gone to like 
10 feet. And I was like, oh, geez. Uh, but I, I think that person ends up okay. I don't I can't tell you the story. I was hoping you were going to end it with, oh, and they were fine. <laughs> but a man did die in the stadium. Uh, well, on my watch, he was here, but he, he lived to tell the story. Uh, Gus Ephraimson happened to be in the right exact place at the right exact time. And he was at guest services and he drops of a heart attack. And right next door, he was standing next to an emergency room doctor that just immediately got down. And I was watching him do CPR. Real life CPR is nothing that you see on the television. This guy's like hands are on his chest and pushing him. And it seemed to be going all the way down to the concrete. And I was like, that guy is going to have some broken ribs. Gus lives, tells the story. He goes back to Lansing, New York. And he comes back, and we let him throw out a first pitch, and the doctor was great. But, I mean, if that guy was anywhere else, if he was in the parking lot, what if he was driving home? What if he was on the other side of the stadium, you know, away from this? But, I mean, again, both of these are not great examples of fun. <laughs> I mean, that bird died. It was kind of like the same. Cool. Thing. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. And nobody has pictures of, didn't Dave Winfield kill a bird with, a like, a home run ball or – was he in batting practice or was it during a game and he got like sued or had to pay a fine for killing a bird? I think he threw a ball at it because he was a dick. But like, um, I, I'm, I'm a little like I was having so much fun, but I'm realizing like what sadistic animals you are. Like Alex, like, yo, this video is awesome. We watch a bird die on camera and Small's like, yeah, dude, there's like 10 feet of blood gushing everywhere. I'm like, oh, my God. And these guys have like little daughters and shit like that. Yeah. I heard you never, just like Disney World, no one's ever pronounced dead at NBT Bank Stadium. Exactly. It happens on the outside. That's right. I will say this. I was out there. Shake, I still still stand out front uh, shaking hands. And I asked everybody how they'd like, you know, where, where'd you come from? What'd you do? Did you have fun? Blah, blah, blah. Tell jokes to people. I just I just joked the whole time with people out there. One night, it was a dollar Thursday. We had fireworks. And we had a guy shoot himself out of a cannon. We had a human cannonball. And uh, guy's coming down the stairs. And I'm like, hey, thanks for coming, blah, blah, blah. Thanks for coming. This is still the chief stays. He's like, dude, he goes, that was pound for pound, the greatest sporting night of my life. He's like, I came in. It's something called Dollar Thursday. And he goes, You're, it was a great baseball game. Then there was fireworks. And then a guy shot himself out of a can and i go dude we do that every night he's like you do i go no oh, <laughs> but it made me feel good because they're like like all right we just did our job this guy just fell in love with minor league baseball because that's what my that's minor league baseball in a nutshell absolutely so you know how to throw a party to stadium tell us like even though you're always busy in the summer what are the ingredients for you for for jason small on a good day for a great summer party well, it's, it starts with the people. You gotta have your friends, your family. Uh, you gotta have. It doesn't need to be great food, but you gotta have some food, and it could be anything from you know barbecue to hopefully somebody puts a little thought and 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 you go. Well, you hopefully you would invite you, and then you would bring good food if you're smart. You invite the right people. You're like, let's invite Matt. <laughs> That's a good good plan. Uh, and then that's just, and then and it doesn't matter where you're at, right? It could be in your backyard, it could be in your driveway. Uh, you know, I am prone to summer. I grew up my entire life in summers at the St. Lawrence River. Uh, from the time I was born to I still try to sneak up there. This stupid baseball business has really eroded my summertime at the St. Lawrence River business, which is no offense. It's not a better business than that's who we compete with is people going to camp and going to the river. But yeah. if it was my choice, I'd be on the river and I'd have some some Labatt's Blues and some Utica clubs uh, and we would just be chilling out. And when you're hot, you jump in the river and somebody's got some tunes going and eventually a, a hot dog boat shows up and you eat a hot dog and you're just with those people having a good time. What, what music are you bumping at this party, though? Oh, I'm a big uh, St. Lawrence River guy, or a big tragically hip uh, old schoolers from up there. I'm, I'm into a lot of Lake Street dive. Uh, I'm all over the place. I could be listening to to Latin music, which I love from the the clubhouse. It could be a country day. It could be the Bee Gees. Uh, it could be some blues. It depends on what the day is, and there, there's no one single thing. But uh, I do 
tend to listen to a lot of Tragically Hip and a lot of Lake Street Dive. Oh, I love Lake Street Dive. My wife loves Lake Street Dive. I saw a band recently at Shifties, and they sounded like just like her voice. It was really wild. Right? I didn't, I didn't even know they existed until a couple of years ago. I went to see them at 1911. And I was like, these guys are awesome. They are, they are awesome. And you've been awesome, too. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to come at you with a lightning round. So we each have three questions, and they are going to be this or that, and then okay. we'll have to explain why. So I have to say this or that. Oh, you're going to say this or that. I picked yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Um, okay. The first one is game time snack, nachos or peanuts? Hmm, peanuts. Just something to, it's easier. You're at the ballpark, and there's something nice about just throwing the shells on the ground and not having to clean them up. It's not great for me on the other end. We have to clean up the peanut shells, but yeah. I believe you're right to throw peanut shells at the ground round and historic NBT Bank Stadium. Yeah, that's the only answer to that question. I, and I love nachos, but I love nachos too. Yeah. I like being able to throw the, I, I'm not like, peanuts wouldn't be my choice, but I like throwing them on the ground. Although the yeah. peanut allergy world now, I'm like, I'm going to throw it near some kid. In the we have an people. allergy. We have a peanut free zone here at Stork NBT Bank Stadium. You can sit there. It's the cleanest oh. spot of the stadium. I don't have, have a peanut, peanut allergy. I just, I just and then one day there was an ball. usher, and he was having a sandwich. I go, oh, you probably have like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. He goes, hey, yeah, I do. I'm like, you're guarding the peanut free zone. You can't have a peanut butter sandwich <laughs> in the peanut free zone, sir. Alex isn't allergic to uh, peanuts just to tell him good jokes, I think. is, is his <laughs> <laughs> Okay, night, night game or day game? Mm, night game. I like it. I like it. It's cooler. I like the idea and the concept of a day game, but uh, night games are where it's at. Yeah. When night I went, summer when night, that sunset's going down. It's the way to go. Like yeah. if you go to a MLB, like a Yankee Stadium game, day games are just not the same. Night game, it's like it feels like a prime time game anywhere. You yeah, go. got a little bit of it's a different vibe. I enjoy a good day game every once in a while just to mix it up, but but overall, I need a night game. And fireworks aren't as cool during the day game. Yeah, and but day drinking is good, but night drinking is better. Agreed. Yeah, I, I don't know, man. I mean, I mm, know that was a hot take right there. That was a hot take. And that's just for straight cover. through. So yeah, yeah. You can't drink all day if you don't start in the morning. Exactly. Um, all right. How about this? Would you rather have a boat party, a killer boat party, or like a killer tailgate party? Boat party. Because then I'm on the water. Right. And then I'm a big water guy. That's your white whale, too. Pardon the expression, but while you're talking about the summer and everything. Okay. That's a pretty fair answer. I was gonna ask if you have a boat, but it wouldn't make much sense for you to own a boat. I do have a boat. You do? I do. I just renewed my registration for my well, my father's boat, which is now my boat. It's a 1966 Chris Craft. Wow. My boat is a, just that's a, that's a junky boat, and my boat is also a junky boat. But I'm, a, I'm my boat's not the party boat to hang out in. It is because you can't mess it up. It's a fishing boat. Wow, cool. How often are you using these boats? Uh, not often enough to actually necessitate owning boats because I'm always here. But uh, I get a little time, and uh, so this weekend I was up at the at the river, and uh, the lovely Rachel and I, my wife, took a couple of nighttime cruises and 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 got out there. So uh, whenever I can is when I is when I go up there. So if there's ever anything going on on the weekends and we don't have a game or an event or something here, I'm north. You got to build like a little like river around the stadium, and you can just kind of float in it in your boat and oversee We're, everything. I worked at the Staten Island Yankees. I wanted to like get a boat and just live like on the uh, in New York Harbor and just tie up outside the stadium. Instead, I lived in New Jersey. It wasn't nearly as romantic. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, Pit pitcher's duel or home run derby? Mm, I am one of the – it takes a little bit to get into it, but I love a good pitcher's duel. Everybody else likes the long ball. I love it. It's great. It's fun. But the other flip side to working in baseball and the pitcher's duel, two-hour game. Yeah. 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 Very valid point. You're right. so, yeah, you're right. too. so it's it's much – we're much more likely to get a home run derby than a good pitching duel these days. For when sure. When you get into a pitcher's duel 
and they're focused. That's the best thing. But you're so right. It takes like six so innings good. to get interested. In we that. were just lucky to have Christian Scott here. We have Don Hamill still, but Christian Scott, I he's getting he he had a start. The Mets blew it for him. Yeah. But he pitched six innings. He's going to get another start. The kid is so good. Those are the kind of guys you get to see here. Yeah. And to see Christian Scott before he's Christian Scott. You got to see Steven Strasburg before he's Steven Strasburg. You got to see Bryce Harper before he was Bryce Harper. You got to see Carlos Delgado before he was Carlos Delgado. You got to see Ron Guidry before he was Ron Guidry. So that is, you know, that last guy, Eddie De La Cruz, the guy that's playing for the Cincinnati Reds right now, he had a home run over the scoreboard last year. Ellie De La Cruz, we got to see him. He was so great. That's awesome. And, you know, the, the pitcher duel thing and seeing players like that, like I grew up, Fred McGriff was my boy. Crime dog. Life, man, the crime dog coming and saw him first with the Chiefs. But, you know, that, that idea of the pitcher's duel, like one of my favorite things ever in baseball is when you see a guy gets like a no-hitter into like the fifth inning all the, in the dugout. You see everybody else, they don't sit next to him or talk to him. Like it's such a cool like thing to watch. I remember being a kid, like so I forget who it was. Cause they ended up being a major league pitcher, but being younger and walking their side of the same with my dad, we could see in the dugout, like him just sitting by himself. My dad explained that to me and teach me how to like keep scoring stuff, man. That that's the thing about baseball. So bizarre is the unwritten rules and just the weird little superstitions. My favorite is I saw Chin Ming Wong there. That was the bet when he came there and there was just the media was surrounding him every time. Yeah. I don't think he played very, like he pitched there for a while, but he, that, then I think he just, his career just yeah. dropped. It happens. But, it's a weird league, Triple A. You know, the guys are blocked on their way up. I mean, what if you were the shortstop of the Yankees and you played behind Derek Jeter? Yeah. Jeez, yeah. you're hoping to get traded. Totally. So would you what would you prefer out of this? Um, like a uh, beautiful night, Mets, your Mets, the Syracuse Mets are in the playoffs, or the perfect like 75 degree opening day. Playoffs. Yeah, we, we we are uniquely situated here in Syracuse, New York. We are tied for second place in the International League for the most championships in the history of the International League with eight championships. We also have not won one in like 46 years. We have the longest drought between championships. And we made the playoffs in 2014, my first year. And we have a fan, David Oaken, great fan. And, and he said, Jason, you're going to be surprised. Because uh, all these other teams, Pawtucket, for example, they draw 8,000 people during the season, but they'll only draw 2,000 people during the playoffs. We might draw 2,000 people during the season, but we're going to draw 8,000 people for the playoffs. I said, David, I said, how do you know? Because the Chiefs never go to the playoffs. He goes, listen to me, Jason. I said, okay. So we had a playoff game. And we had, you know, we were mulling around doing Halloween and stuff here, or a haunted house. And I got the team together. I said, we're so far ahead. We're locked in. We're going to put all of our energy into promoting this playoff game. We're just going to go all in because we're going to make more money on one playoff game than all the haunted house stuff we could do. We're going to give up on the haunted house business. So we put it all in, and it was a madhouse in here. We had about 6,600, 6,700 people. It was a great atmosphere. We lost the game. We were out of it. But that one night, it was amazing. And I went to the International League meeting, the fall meetings. The meeting gets wrapped up. And the league president says, anybody have anything that they want to say? Uh, and this guy uh, 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 from Pawtucket, and that wasn't Bill Wanless. I don't know his guy's name. Bill, Bill somebody. He says, I got to get up and I got to say, I've been in this league for 40 years. And there's never been a more exciting playoff game than what I witnessed in Syracuse uh, this this past month. He goes, it was the most amazing scene I've ever seen. Syracuse will get behind us if we've made, we haven't made the playoffs since, but this year, <laughs> we made the playoffs. I expect a madhouse at historic MVT Bank Stadium. We were, we were at that game, Matt, and it was awesome. And I remember oh, right. the first time we sat right behind home plate and they scored the first round they scored and it was just like mayhem. And you just are so not used to seeing that, and it's it was awesome, and it was. Important. I was in the concession stands all night because we couldn't handle it. I was making hot dogs, and I ended up at some bar, and uh, and I was pouring drinks at, at, at our makeshift bar in the middle of the concourse. It, it's it's unfortunate because you guys you guys played the first two on the you guys were the better seed, but you played the first two on the road to get three at home, and, and then ended up losing the first two. 
I think well, at, the, at that point of the year. So I went to Manny Burris. Manny Burris, the coolest guy in the whole history of the world. And he was the unofficial team captain. A couple of World Series rings with uh, with the San Francisco uh, Giants. I said, Manny, I said, are we going to, uh, do we want to win this thing? He goes, I don't know. He goes, I'll get back to you. So he came up to my office and he ne- the, never would come up here. He goes, I talked to the boys. We're in it. We might as well try to win it. Because sometimes the team just want to mail it in. They want to go home. They've been a long team. So the team that wants to be in it has a good chance of winning it. So we went to Pawtucket. We lost two games. He came back. He's like, pack the bags, boys. We're shutting her down. Aren't, aren't a lot of the guys yeah. like living in the – So close. We almost won that game. Yeah. They're like living in the clubhouse at that point, aren't they? Oh, 100%. <laughs> so they're like, what are, what are we going to get out of here? And that's the worst because you want them to want to win it. I guess if they get further, as you get a little bit further in it, probably a little bit more enticing. But, like, you played a lot of games that season. And the team usually just took, you know, the, the at the time that was the Nationals, probably took six or seven of our best, best players, players for their yeah. roster. because it's Yeah, you want to go up. My, my dad might have a ring from the last championship, his, his ring that he has. I don't know if it's the Yankees. He, 1980. Didn't they know they they probably won it? Last one was in the seventies, yeah, with the Yankees. Like seventy nine or eighty, he has a ring from. That's it's it's wildly small compared to the rings they get now. But it's oh small. yeah, <laughs> like a high school ring. Yeah. <laughs> it's like I'm like, did you buy that yourself? Did you get to pick that out? Um, okay, last question. Um, who was the cooler star to have uh, have at the stadium for for a good amount of time? Tim Tebow or Bryce Harper? I did not. Uh, I was not part of the Bryce Harper uh, time period, I so I, I would have to say Tim Tebow because I did not know. But because uh, but Tim was great, and uh, and I remember when I first met him. I went down to spring training and 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 met him, and I was starstruck. I was like, yeah. I go, oh, well, I'm Mr. Tim Tebow. So I would always call him Mr. Tim Tebow every time I saw him. And he's like, Jason, you don't have to call me Mr. Tim Tebow. I'm like, it's a thing now, bro. I call you Mr. Tim Tebow. So, uh, but Tim was great. And uh, I think he liked talking to me because, you know, I just talked gibberish to him and we would just talk silly things about, you know, his diet and, and, and carbonated beverages. And, and he has this great, what he thinks it's great, great ginger ale. He's like, this is, it has no sugar or anything in it. He goes, I go, I drink a lot of ginger ale. Like a lot of ginger ale I drink usually has some sort of uh, alcohol in it. But uh, I like a nice rye and ginger. But I do drink a lot of ginger ale. He says, taste this. This is the greatest ginger ale you've ever drank. So I took a sip of it. He says, what do you think? I said, that is the worst ginger ale I've ever eaten, drinking in my life. He's like, oh, you know what you're talking about. I was like, this needs a little bit of, of, uh, of, of VO. Little, little little Canadian club in this, and it'll make this taste much better. <laughs> That's awesome. He was here for a good amount of time too, which is kind of cool. Yeah, he was a good dude. Awesome, awesome. So, um, what do you want to tell the people before we wrap this thing up? Anything of importance that they should know about you, about the Mets, about anything that they should know about, babe? You know, just come on out. You know, if you want a good time, it's it's. Uh, we're just getting in, you know, you've already picked, been smart. You didn't come in March and April. It's cold and miserable, but now it starts warming up. We've got one, two, three, four, five more months of baseball. Um, and, you, and and we've got whatever you want. So come on out. It's Tell your friends. If you haven't been out, come out. Um, if you like craft beer, we have that great craft beer and fireworks Friday. If you like fireworks, we've got fireworks. If you don't like fireworks, that's what Tuesday and Wednesday are for. Uh, so we've got a little bit of everything. Uh, we can go cheap from a tailgate in the parking lot to coming in to uh, to a fancy night up in the suites. Our suites are essentially sold out for the season. Our party areas are pretty much sold out for all the warm months. Um, but like you said, there's you can just walk around and, and have a good time. And you might be able to support an organization or just grab your girlfriend, grab your boyfriend, grab your friend, grab your family. Come out and enjoy a game. If everybody comes once, we'll be one of the most successful teams in the history of baseball. I love it. And you know what? It is a great time at those games, and you've been a great time tonight. So for the great Jason Smorrell, I'm at Alex DeRosa. After party out.